Hvad du siger du? Ah, as I'll ever be. <laughs> yeah. Hej och välkomna till Arktas på Skeppsholmen and I'll switch languages directly. This is a lecture that we will hear from Kieran Long, the head of Arktas, who are we are very happy to be here today to have a lecture in the series of jubileumsföreläsningar. Arctic Sweden celebrate 20 years this year and several of our prizes have their birthdays in 2022. So we'll do a series of inspirational lectures and this is one of them. And it will be about Sigurd Leverens, the first architect to receive uh, the greatest award for Swedish architecture, which is Kasper Salin Priset, the Kasper Salin Award. And he received it in 1962, or his building received it in 1962, St. Mark's Church, Church in Björkhagen. And Kieran Long is also the main curator of an exhibition about Sigurd Leverens, which is at this moment at Arktes. It's the first time uh, the complete works of Sigurd Leverens have been collected and are shown to a public and we are very happy to have this lecture here today where we'll hear more about the work of Sigurd Leverens who is known to be a quite severe <laughs> and stubborn person but is also a very joyful and uh, playful part of his architecture as well but we'll hear all about it but mostly about St. Marcus Church where we'll start. Thank you, the word is yours. Thanks Tove um, and thanks like as Tove said amazing you're here the people who are here it's miserable out there. And uh, as I usually say, like being a museum director on Krebs Holman can sometimes feel like Stockholm actively tries to stop people coming to our museum <laughs> by, <laughs> by having a marathon or having Grand Hotel closed down the road or the ferry doesn't stop. And, you know, so you're, you're heroes, the people who are in the room. But nice to also speak to those of you who are connected online. And thanks so much to Sveriges Architekter for the invitation um, to speak as part of the Jubileums for Lesning. And thanks also that I get to speak in English. I think you're being kind to me to in a one way because, um, of course, there's a streaming audience that could be uh, broader than just Swedish speaking. I have done um, talks about Leverance in, in Swedish, but it's a lot easier for me in, in English. And so I'm looking forward to giving this talk. And, and this talk is, in a way, a version of a, of a talk that I gave in the US recently um, at three, two different universities and at the Canadian Center for Architecture um, about our exhibition project and the research we've made. And what's interesting about that is that, of course, there's a very strong interest internationally in Sigurd Leverance's work. I usually say that one of the reasons I moved to Stockholm to be the director of, of Eichdes was the knowledge that Leverance's complete archive was in the basement and had never been properly exhibited. Um, it was too good an opportunity for a museum person to miss. And so it's very satisfying, of course, to now have the exhibition upstairs five years after I started here. Um, in such fine uh, shape um, and having had such a fine reception. Before I get into the lecture, though, we have a special prize, uh, special um, surprise to mark this amazing, what is it, 60 years then, 60 year anniversary of, of the Caspar Salim Prize. We have, in fact, this lovely object here. Um, this is, in fact, the Caspar Salim Prize from 1962 that was given to Sigurd Leverance um, for winning the, the prize for Mark, St. Marcus Schirkam for St. Mark's Church. It says here, Svenska Architekt Förenings Salim Pries, or Stos, 1962, um, at the bottom. It's this sculpture by Bro Jult. And one of these does stand in the, in the building today. There is one in the wall, on the wall at St. Mark's. Um, one of the curiosities, though, is that he seems to have had two. I don't know if that was the convention then or if it still is, that you get one for yourself. So you get one for yourself, you get one for the building. The one that's on the building is hanging there. And before Sigurd Leverance's extraordinary archive of 13,000 drawings and many other handlinger and other kinds of objects came to the museum, it was for a brief period at Lund University in their basement. Um, it was studied there. And there was, of course, he, he died, of course, when he died, of course, he was living in Lund. 1975. Um, there were architects there who were working on publications and projects about his work. So for a while, the collection was taken in by Lund University. And then, shortly afterwards, transferred to Architekturmuseet, today Arkdes. Some things were lost on the way. I don't know why. Maybe somebody in this room might 
Um, and maybe there was a judgment that some things weren't interesting. I know, for example, there were pieces of furniture that he owned there in that basement in Lund, which never made it here, and I don't know where they are today. In fact, I've heard rumors about some young architects who may have stole them as students, <laughs> but, um, which is, in a way, a kind of nice home for them. But one of the things that didn't arrive was this Caspar Salim Prize. And I was at the, at the um, Caspar Salim Prize giving this year, in fact, and Krista Malmström, a pro long-time professor at Lund and fantastic architect and Caspar Salim Prize winner himself, came up to me and said, Kieran, I've got an amazing thing in my, in my, uh, um, Veska, in my uh, suitcase for you. I was like, Krista, I'm not sure where this is going. Um, what, are, what are we talking about? So, no, no, send somebody to my hotel later. <laughs> You'll find out, which we did. My colleague uh, um, Karin Glasserman, a curator on our team, went there. And sure enough, it was the bronze of... Uh, of um, Sigurd Leverance's Marcus Schierkan Caspar Salim Prize. It had been discovered in a rubbish bin um, by some students who were given an extra job to clean out the basement at this part of Lund University and took it for the hourly pay. And lucky they were architecture students. They looked inside one of these rubbish bags and found this Caspar Salim Prize, rescued it um, and handed it over to Krista. So now here it is. It's the latest acquisition to Arctis's four million strong collection of objects. Um, of, the, uh, of the modern history of Swedish architecture. Um, and very proud to have it next to me while, while talking about uh, Leverance and, and his work today. What does it mean to try to investigate the imaginative work of architecture? One could even ask, is it even a relevant task today when so much focus is, of course, justly on architecture's role in the systematic injustices and failures of modern societies, and of course on the people who have been excluded by the project of modern architecture. Add to that the very many possible responsibilities of a contemporary architect. It can feel hard, difficult sometimes, to even justify a focus on imagination, on the art of architecture. But what we're going to look at together today is the work of an architect I consider to be the greatest in Swedish history, and certainly responsible for some of the richest, most complex and powerful buildings and landscapes of the modern period anywhere. We've made four and a half years of research on, on the archive at Arkdes, and, and we've traveled around the country to find many other archives with, with works by Leverance in them. And the result is, of course, the exhibition um, and the publication. This is the exhibition. I guess most of the people here have seen it or will see it today, I hope. Um, and the book, which form a kind of, which have had a big impact here. And, and one of the interesting things, I think, has been to see the reaction to this exhibition, that it has awoken a conversation about the art of architecture, or at least the artistic intent of architecture. What might it be? What might it achieve? For this talk, I want to give you an insight in, in a way to some of the backstory of this project, to the collection, to his things, to how my colleagues and I dealt with the, the many, many objects and drawings that constitute his, his collection. And although, of course, you'll see that we definitely have a deep commitment to Leverance's work and a love for it, the objective here is not to make Leverance into the latest hero in the history of modern architecture, the latest um, sort of uh, entry into some sort of Valhalla of modernist architecture. What we've tried to do with our project is to select drawings and accounts of his work, which I want to suggest has tremendous relevance for contemporary practice. Leverance's work throughout his life was in opposition to the modes of architecture, architectural production, dominant in the modern period, in Sweden especially. And it was in opposition, in some sense, to the most dominant uh, influence on modern architecture in Sweden, which was the building of the social democratic welfare state. That whole project was something that Leverance arguably was not much involved in. And we're going to go into reasons why I think that is and why that's important. You who are in this room, of course, know Sigurd Leverance's, Le Leverance's work, and many of you will have seen the show. But most people are aware of, most of all, of four projects. The two great cemeteries, the Woodland Cemetery here in Stockholm, the Eastern Cemetery 
in Malmo, and then the two late churches, Marcus Chirkan and St. Peter's Church in Klippan. Those four projects define his international reputation most strongly, absolutely, and to some extent are how we see him here today. And in some ways, our title for, this, for the exhibition and for the book, Architect of Death and Life, takes this kind of reputational starting point as our own starting point. What does it mean to form a picture of an architect through churches and graveyards, through, let's say, the architecture of death, or let's say, the architecture of mortality, the architecture of your eternal soul, the most profound meanings of what it means to be a human being. He is certainly a poet of those things. There is no doubt that Leverance is a great artist of those things. But in our work, and especially in the research that Johan Ern, my colleague, made on the, on the catalog and his, um, his comprehensive account of Leverance's life in the book, we discovered another picture of Leverance, especially in the 1920s and 30s, an architect deeply engaged with the life of the commercial city, the growing commercial uh, modern city, especially of Stockholm in the 1910s, 20s, and 30s. In that period of his work, and you'll, and you'll see this, he was fascinated by the fleeting pleasures of the modern city, of shopping and of dining and smoking a cigarette outside your office. We'll come back to why this is important, but we can say Leverance is an, is an architect whose work oscillates in between the deepest meanings of what it means to be a human being and the shallowest, and not much in between. Shopping and death. We'll come back to this in a minute. This is the picture. This is a spread from our book. Um, this is the image, I think, that many of us have of Leverance, if we know much of him. An image of him as an old man um, in, in his uh, late uh, working places, either in Skanna or in Lund, in the black box. Um, and, the, and, and a mythology has certainly grown up around Leverance and this picture of the old, quiet man who could be severe, certainly, who didn't have much to say, who refused opportunities to lecture internationally and even nationally, who didn't turn up to the opening of his own exhibition in, in Copenhagen, the only exhibition of his work that happened while he was alive. And I would like to also suggest, and I suggest it in, the essay, in my essay in the book, that this picture is was a necessary picture for the pe of an architect for the people who knew him in 1970 to 1975. Think what was happening to the Swedish construction industry in that period, to architecture in that period. Architecture had lost its position that it had had for the first half of the 20th century in favor of a much more efficient building, a construction-oriented construction industry that was in full flow with the Million Programme and all of the achievements, but also drawbacks of that project. Leverance's work in that period, or his late period, was of course highly crafted. The two great churches, these great brick churches, highly, very much engaged with questions of hand work and with art. And the architects, the young architects who loved his work then, Van Nieberg, Klaus Anselm, the people in Lund around him, needed him to represent resistance to industrialization. They needed him to be a kind of lost possibility of architecture, that the construction industry was forgetting about, but these Lund architects would keep that flame alive. This is my interpretation, of course, but a reasonable one, I think. The question today is, what do we need Leverance to be? When we look at an artist of this stature, what do we need him to be? Of course, some of these issues are still the case. We still wish the construction industry was not as standardized and inefficient and pathetically poor quality as it is in Sweden today. But there are other concerns that he is also relevant for and we're going to come into some of that. So why Leverance in particular? Well, he un undoubtedly has a value to practicing architects around the world today, and we know that at Arc there's from the hundreds of requests we receive every year to consult the collection or to visit um, Stockholm to see his work. And when I was a young architecture critic in the early 2000s and the late 90s, the first book on the table of every good young architect would be either Jana Arlene's book from the 1980s about Sigurd Leverance or Colin St. John Wilson's famous book in English about Leverance, also published in the 80s by the Architectural Association. I was brought up with Leverance, you can say, um, in my informal architectural education. And you think of some of those names now, from Tony Fretton to Florian Bagel to Carissa St. John, Stephen Taylor to Patrick Lynch to a younger generation of people who are coming through. These are um, very important architects um, all working out of Leverance's uh, heritage. 
And many of them received their intuitions towards Leverance's work through this famous Colin St. John Wilson book, The Dilemma of Classicism. This was a book that had, um, it was mainly about the churches, and it had a sandpaper cover. So that meant that if you put it in your bookshelf, it destroyed all the books next to it, like slowly rubbing them away, like almost like a kind of material expression of this, of what Joanna Ern describes as this Malt Stons man, this, this uh, oppositional force the Leverance was in, in modern architecture. But they all had that book. Um, I, in fact, stole a copy of that book from a magazine, the library of a magazine I worked for as a journalist in the 1990s. Um, they later got rid of their library, so I think it was okay. I think it ended up in a good place. So we could say, yeah, Leverance is important because of a critical mass of excellent architects find his work interesting enough to go back to time and again. But of course, artistic quality is not a popularity contest. I think it's worth commenting that the distinctive feature of many architects' interest in Leverance is that the, it is the artistic depth of his work that seems to hold their attention. His work seems to suggest what is possible with architecture, spatially, artistically, in it, all of its effects, especially the churches. I always give the example of architects who, who come and see the churches just once. They travel from overseas to see the churches. And they go away and they write things as Adam Crusoe has done, and I appreciate Adam's writing on, on Leverance very much. But he writes, it must be very difficult to be a parishioner in one of these churches. There's so, there's so much. There's so much effect. There's so many architectural tricks. There's things happening all the time. There's the light and there's the floor and there's the patterns and there's the tapestries. And, oh, it's overwhelming for these architects. And they think it must be overwhelming for everybody else. I'm not sure it is, actually. I think they're much more homely, modest buildings in their, in their weekly use. And I think being here in Sweden and working with these buildings closely, you know that. But in any case, it is the artistic power that seems to appeal to architects around the world. Perversely, for historians of architecture, Leverance seems to be more of a puzzle. So architects love him. What do the historians think? There's actually little mention of him in contemporary historical writing in Sweden about architecture. Um, he was not a big contributor to the building of the welfare state. He did no work during the Million Programme in housing and in all of these kind of dominant modes of architecture that are probably the biggest interests of academics and historians in our field today. He's not emblematic of any political forces or any bigger economic forces, um, so he becomes a kind of anomaly, an exception. Um, I, I don't think Helena Matson would mind me saying that in Helena's book, um, Swedish Modernism, a collection of essays, probably the most recent over, overarching attempt to, to write a series of essays about Swedish architecture, Leverance is not mentioned a single time, not by any of the authors. So how should we think of an architect whose legacy is artistic, whose appeal seems to be to practitioners, when many of the tools of research and analysis used by historians today have to do with the economic, political, and cultural struggles in which work is created. I just want to end these reflections with a quote from a book by two um, art historians from a book called Anachronic Renaissance, um, Christopher Nagel and um, Wood, who's, I can't remember his first name, where they say, the historian who interprets a work of art as a token within a system of symbolic exchanges opens up a window onto the hidden mechanisms of social power in remote and vanished societies. But such an interpretation tends to not want to take up the possibility of a work's symbolic reach beyond the historical life world that created it. Art is the name of a possibility of a conversation across time, a conversation more meaningful than the present's merely forensic reconstruction of the past. This seems to me how we should see Leverance's work and perhaps our project. As an institution, we're engaged with the realities and the conditions of producing cities today. But this project is a sincere and prolonged project of trying to understand what is in, in, enduringly powerful in Leverance's imaginative work. So we turn to the archive. The practical work of going through the archive here at ArcDes was done in the main by Johan Ern, our collection, um, curator of collections, with help from Mikael Andersson, who are my two co-authors on the book we made. 13,000 objects, which were reduced to around 900 for the book, 
around 600 in the exhibition, around 400 of which are drawings. But the, the collection, of course, includes everything that he had with him in his final working room. This is the so-called black box, Svata that he worked in between 1970 and 1975 in Lund, a little building designed for him by Klaus Anselm with a single roof light and with no windows and this strange foil on the wall. And in that room, he had his folders of drawings, which he arranged partly himself. We don't know exactly what the logic of the arrangement was, but it's, they are still in our, in our folders in the same order that Leverance arranged them. He knew that his work was valuable. He knew that it was going to be kept. He knew that we would still be talking about it now. And amongst the drawings, there are, of course, other things, reference material and photography, correspondence, bills, biographical objects of different kinds. We have books from his library, his entire wonderful book collection. We have the entry ticket for Leverance's daughter to the Stockholm exhibition of 1930. We have library tickets from the Royal Library during the design process of Malmö City Theatre. We have all sorts of extremely detailed things. So uh, what I usually also say is that our project is far from the final word about Sigurd Leverance. It is the start of what we need you all to continue to do. Deeper research about parts of his life and parts of his work that still are yet to do. Piles of ske sketches that are not even in the exhibition and not in the book either. But it is interesting, though, that in the project, what you see is a history of architectural drawing also. Between 1903, the earliest object in the exhibition, a student drawing he made of a, of a, of a um, uh, um, steam engine. I'm I give so many Wiesninger in Swedish now, there are certain things I can't say in English. Um, <laughs> a steam engine in Chalmers in his mechanical engineering education in 1903 to 1971 and the sort of end of the completion of his final freestanding building, the lobster kiosk, the flower kiosk at the Eastern Cemetery. Imagine what happened in architecture in that period between 1903 uh, and 1971. Imagine what happened in how offices were run, how the construction industry was run, how a contract was signed. You know, all, he lived through those changes and thrived, really, in almost all of those um, different conditions. So the, so the first uh, um, room of our exhibition is dedicated to this space. And here are some photos of Svata Lordan. And you see these folders and rolled up drawings. And you see the maquette of the sculpture by Bro York that stands in the lobby of Malmö City Theatre, Malmö Opera House today, of course. And you see strange drawings and posters and things that he chose to put up. We don't know why, really. And there we see him as an old man drinking whiskey. This wasn't his favorite whiskey. His favorite whiskey was Vat 69, actually. This is how detailed knowledge we have of Leverance, but this is, seems to be Dewar's or some other brand. And you'll see in our exhibition, too, that we hang some of these posters in the same way, and we stack the books as they were stacked in this room to try to give us some atmosphere of what this place was, this beautiful wall. And much of the material there is mysterious to us. One of the most powerful um, parts of the collection is Leverance's own travel photography. And these are a selection of the famous Italian journey photos, which have been published rather many times. There's a new book about them by, um, that's just come out this year, and they've been written about many times. We don't know what some of these places are. We don't know why he took these photos, and we don't know how he used them. But we know he kept them together, and we know he kept them in a folder with a date on them. Um, and we know that they're in Italy. And in fact, um, our, my former colleague Eric Turnquist is working on a fantastic project to try to recreate some of these photographs and find where they were taken. Some of them we can see are Hadrian's Villa, some of them mysterious floor um, patterns. But you can see kind of recurring interests, and they seem to be visual interests. Textures of walls, patterns of floors, the meeting of strangely aged materials, and certainly landscapes in relation to buildings, sometimes informal groups of buildings. This is a kind of iconic picture of his Pompeian, um, Pompeian journey. And it's amazing to think about what it meant to be an architect in the 1900s or 1910s. Uh, traveling to these places, as, as uh, many people did, as Gunnar Asplund did, and many Swedish architects did, meeting this young boy in Hadrian's villa 
and taking this picture and leaving it for us more than 100 years later to puzzle out. And I hope really what by showing these we do is give you a kind of clue to the, to the world he was in at this time. Take this piece, for example, which hangs in the exhibition. It's a cutting from Le Matin, French newspaper from 1920-something. Yeah, 1920. And we know that Leverance went to, uh, went to Paris rather often in the 20s and loved Paris and was very engaged, especially in Paris's commercial architecture in the shops and shopping streets of Paris, very interested in that. And you can imagine him sitting in a cafe with this newspaper. And 1920, five years after he won the competition for Woodland Cemetery and three years after he won the competition for Mama Eastern Cemetery, he sees an article about a war graves, about war graves. And we can't know whether this was a visual reference or a thing he thought he'd look up later, or a person he knew who was involved in this project. Um, but for me, it gives you a sense of what world he was living in, the post-World War I period, building cemeteries in that period. What did that mean? It adds a whole new aspect, I think, to his creative process. And then kind of, of course, the major monuments of Europe, the Zwinga in Dresden. No coincidence to me that he's interested in, in Baroque architecture of Dresden. Um, but maybe every Swedish architect was, we, you know, in this period. It's hard to say. And then closer to home, wonderful photographs of, of, uh, of Gamla Stan. This is Berlin, of course. He was a student in Berlin. But pictures of the Danish and Swedish countryside, vernacular buildings, swapping back to references from Italy. All of these references he had with him. In Svartalodan in 1975, he had them with him some of them in the 1910s. And I usually end this little sort of the imaginative world of Leverance part by talking about this amazing object. This is a, uh, a sketch, as you can see, a perspective sketch of a bishop's chair in, in a quite famous cathedral in Torcello near, the, near Venice in the Veneto. And in fact, it's not drawn by Sigurd Leverance. This was drawn by Torsten Stobelius. Torsten Stobelius was Sigurd Leverance's first business partner in the 1900s and 1910s. They had a partnership together for nearly 10 years. And it hung on the wall in Svartalordan, and it might have just been a memory of an old friend who had died before he had, who he'd once known and once liked enough to start a business with. On the other hand, of course, in the early 60s, Leverance was designing a church in brick with a, church, with a chair set into the back wall, um, and that's St. Peter's. It doesn't look exactly like this, but it doesn't look completely unlike this either, and it's not impossible to imagine that it's a reference. I have the feeling that Leverance was an architect whose references were very broad, and were always w all of them were always with him, all of the time. He didn't graduate from classicism, from national romanticism to classicism, and then to modernity, and leave the other references behind him. He had with him a wide range of visual references his whole life and career. In 1915, Sieg Leverance and Gunnar Asplund together won the competition for the Woodland Cemetery. And this is the drawing, this is the competition entry. I sometimes say when I give Wiesninger, this, is my, this might be the most important drawing in the history of Swedish architecture, you could say. It's a beautiful, nearly two meters long drawing. It's a map of the proposal, their proposal for the cemetery. It's not signed, it was an anonymous competition. Um, and what's really striking about it, I think, is that it doesn't resemble very much the built cemetery. It's quite hard to identify aspects of the cemetery that we have today. But you see some. You can just about see the axis through the woodland, the so-called way of the seven wells, which in that time had, in fact, seven wells proposed for it. In the built version, it does not. You can see that the entrance is in more or less the correct position, although it doesn't look quite like it does today. And you can see some kind of gathering place where today we have Elm Hayden, the, the uh, memorial Kulle hill um, that leads you into the landscape. But almost nothing else. None, none of the locations of the buildings are, are as they were built. But in these rough sketches, which were the other part of the competition entry, I think you do see what we experience in Woodland Cemetery. Again, we don't see any of these specific places but the atmosphere, the constant repetition of a canopy of high trees with light, bright light shining through them and a dark ground with gravestones amongst the trees comes back and back and back. And this was an extraordinary visual evocation, I think, of, of a quite unknowable effect. There were no cemeteries like this in Sweden at this time. 
And these, in particular, these overdrawn photographs capture for me perfectly the experience on a fairly dull day with a bright sky, what it's like to walk through Woodland Cemetery. Their exhibition entry was very much about atmosphere, and very much not about um, specific places and specific solutions to specific problems. I mean, we can't even know what this was supposed to be. There's nothing on Woodland Cemetery that looks like this. Um, there, there are a whole series of ideas for different kinds of landscape rooms in the competition, um, but they were, they were thrown away. So this is the complete competition entry. You can see it upstairs. It's one of the few things that, in fact, Arcdes does not own, um, sadly. Um, we're working on it, but it's still the property of the city of Stockholm. So in 1915, they won the competition. The division of labor between Sigurd Leverance and Gunnar Asplund seems to have been that Asplund had the job of doing the first building, and that was quite urgent. There needed to be a chapel. So the Woodland Chapel was, the f wood was Asplund's responsibility, and Leverance worked very intensively on the landscape and especially the entrance to the, and the entrance threshold. This is what we know it to be today. It's rather straightforward, this rough stone wall with its grass cap and this kind of modest columnar um, fountain that you pass on the way in. It's a half circle, as you all know, with, with a kind of offset um, entrance. And the second part of that threshold is, of course, Elm Hayden and the big green space before you see any, um, any graves at all, the long distance it takes to walk before you see any um, markers of, of uh, dead bodies. And then, of course, through um, through the way of the seven wells towards the resurrection chapel. But this entrance I just wanted to dwell on a moment because he spent nearly 20 years developing different versions of designs for this. And it's a very complicated timeline that's quite um, difficult even for us to understand because the, many of the proposals for the entrance for Woodland Cemetery are so different from one another. Take this one, which is more or less sort of what we see today, the half circle entrance, the same offset, some idea here of, I don't know, some kind of gathering space. But you, know, you can sort of see a relationship with what's built. Whereas this one, instead of Elm Hayden and the elegant green space that we have today, we have a kind of necropolis with a symmetrical arrangement, with many, many buildings and tombs. You know, it just doesn't seem at all like the atmosphere of, of the Woodland Cemetery that we have today. It doesn't seem to be in the same budget framework <laughs> as, the, as the, of the cemetery we have today. There's, and, and it shows you something about Leverance's process that he worked in parallel on sometimes wildly different ideas for, for the same brief. You see quite resolved perspective gouaches and, and watercolors like this one of where obelisks appear and artworks and small temples and other kinds of uh, fountain. This is in fact a placement of the artwork that ended up outside Asplund's chapel, um, the Chapel of the Holy Cross, placed in the entrance. But I want to talk about this proposal which I find a kind of key to understanding not just Woodland Cemetery, but perhaps Leverance more broadly. This is a proposal you see here, the half circle of the entrance to the Woodland Cemetery, um, as we, more or less as we know it today. The tubes in this direction, you know, the Skogshukogod and Tunnelbana. And in the space he's placed a proposed open-sided Doric temple, um, which kind of would face you, of course, as you come from the tube and maybe turn you around the corner in some way. But it doesn't seem to really have any clear function. Oh, now my slides are a bit out of order. Here, here's the other version. But he drew it at a reasonable level of detail. So there's two elevations and a plan. You see this open-sided Doric thing. The, the orders don't quite match the pediment. There's all sorts of strangeness going on with the classical orders here. But the thing I want to talk about is this. And you can't see on this low-resolution screen. It's in very, very tiny letters. But this is a telephone kiosk. That double square is a telephone kiosk. So this is kind of the world's most spectacularly grand telephone box. Um, it's almost like a joke, right? You can't help but laugh as when, I, when you read. And, and you wonder how serious he was about this. Did he really mean to make this telephone box? Or is it telling us something else? For me, the whole of Woodland Cemetery has to do with technological change and history colliding and creating new poetic challenges and poetic possibilities. And this is like a little key to understanding that. A Doric temple, like the Ur kind of architectural figure, and the telephone box hanging there in between two columns, 
So not in the middle, and not at one end, and not in a column or any. It's interrupting the columns. This strange piece of technology that we have to find a place for, we have to find an expression for, we have to understand what its po poetic possibilities are. This never happened. But it's possible to understand all of the rest of Woodland Cemetery in this context. Think of all of the new technologies that were appearing in Stockholm in 1910s and the early 20s. The Tunnel Barna itself, a drastic piece of new infrastructure that created the possibility for the Woodland Cemetery at all to even go there is possible because of this new railway. Think of the growing industrial south of the city in, around Hammarby and so on, and the new demands that put on people's bodies and the new illnesses uh, that were coming. This was just, 1915 was a couple of years before the Spanish flu epidemic. And then think of crematoriums. Suddenly, we were going to burn bodies and not bury them. This is a traumatic cultural transformation that needs to be translated, can only be translated by art and by architecture and by design and by culture. So the whole project of Woodland Cemetery is a translation of traumatic technological change into public space that we can all share. And when you go there now on All Souls Night with 30,000 other people with candles, even though none of you believe in God because you're the most secular country in the world, and they walk around that, thing, that place together, that's what Leverance has made. And of course, that's blend. They've taken all that technological change and made a place of lasting meaning for all of us. And without wanting to instrumentalize that too much, one thinks about the challenges today of sustainability, of ecological change, of social change, of including people who have been outside, the unbelievably strong drivers that are driving policy and are driving you know, how we must practice architecture today. Our job is not to simply reflect those changes or deliver them or make them more efficient. Our job is to make them poetry in order that people can understand them and they can relate to one another in their context. And that's what I think Leverance did so brilliantly. There's much more we could say, but in time's sake, we will skip over a little bit the Resurrection Chapel. Maybe just these sketches. These are wonderful sequence of sketches which tells you something about his working process. Um, I suspect he had quite a lot of assistants doing these, <laughs> but these, the sequences of these kind are quite common in Leverance's, um, Leverance's archive. Very similar views with tiny, tiny variations, all done at the same time and simply taped up. You can often see pieces of tape still left on the drawings and judged visually. I often like to compare this, for those of you who are working in practice today, with the idea of iterating a digital drawing. A digital drawing is never done like this in sort of 20 different parallel versions. You have one version, which you update and iterate. Leverance didn't work like that. He worked on wildly different versions of things that he then narrowed down and judged um, with his eye in the office. And I think you see that really clearly in these beautiful sketches. Big highlights, which I'm not gonna, I'm gonna skip over now in the interest of time. Let's go forward a bit. We skip Eastern Cemetery too, just again in the interest of time. Um, talk about drawings just briefly. How are we doing for time? 20 minutes left. Talk about drawings. Um, this is a drawing which I think illustrates what I was trying to say about how the exhibition is not just about leverance, it's about architectural drawing and the history of architectural drawing. This is a a drawing by Leverance of the roof of um, Valdemar's Wieck's um, graveyard chapel, a lesser known Leverance work, of course, especially internationally, um, and a very weird building, let's be honest. Um, a kind of Game of Thrones vibe, <laughs> something, I don't know, something um, hobbit y about it. But of course, the roof is extremely beautiful form. It's also the inspiration for the roof, one of the roofs in the exhibition design of Cru by Cruz St. John in our exhibition. Um, this is sort of curved in two directions, of course, and it's a timber roof sitting on a big, thick stone wall. But what's interesting about this drawing, I think, is that this drawing contains all the information you need to build the entire building. You don't need any other drawings. There are, in fact, two other drawings um, of, of this, but only two. So three pieces of paper allow you to build this entire project. This is the building culture that Leverance grew up in and was trained in and, and delivered his first buildings in. And think about completing his final buildings in the 1960s and how many drawings <laughs> were required for, for those buildings and how many subcontractors and how 
how big the construction industry had become. And look, I just think it's so beautiful to see now. You see horizontal sections at different, uh, different heights of the, of the roof. You see a section of the roof. You see a plan of the roof. You see the details of how the roof meets, meets the wall. And you see individual um, joinery details to help the joiner figure out you know, difficult junctions and so on. It's not, I'm not being nostalgic. I don't long for this. I just think it's interesting to see an artist who was able to work like this and then able to work on a building like St. Mark's or, like, or St. Peter's in an industrial uh, context. Maybe a similar example is this. This is the earliest drawing we have by Sigurd Leverance in the exhibition from 1903, a student drawing he made of a section through a steam engine. He studied, of course, at Chalmers as an industrial designer. Um, apart from the fact one wonders where, how many engineering students today could make this drawing, um, it's, it, it shows a, a discipline that he brought to his work and that continued through his work. It also shows a kind of out-of-date mode of drawing that we have no use for anymore. But it's interesting to think about what the artistic possibilities were that he was, he was beginning with. His early life, his early career, of course, was to end the partnership with Torsten Stabelius. And the masterpiece from that period is the uh, boathouse. Anybody here who wants to start a campaign with me for them to change the roof back to the original roof would uh, be welcome. Come and see me afterwards. Um, this terrible tile roof. But it's wonderful that the Rod Freening is still a Rod Freening. It's still a boathouse, still used for its, in, in, its, um, its initial purpose. Still looking beautiful in many ways. And this watercolor does show one of those threshold moments in, of the imagination. All of Leverance's work in the 1900s and the early 1910s was in a kind of nas national romantic vein, and the drawings were fairly dry, very beautiful, but fairly dry. But this is not. This is a watercolor showing the boathouse in the kind of green area of, the, of your Gordon. But entering stage left in Midias Reis is this boat. And the boat looks like a knife. It's a modern object cutting the landscape in two, and ben beneath it are the reflections of the brightly colored caps of the rowers. This is a completely different kind of expression. This is a psychological world, a world of reflections and a world of immateriality. And it's almost like, for me, the, the building is one thing, it's almost disappearing, and these people are another. When Leverance enters the 1920s, he looks like this, <laughs> like he's a He's a presentable businessman. And at the heart of a, li uh, a very alive and thriving architecture and art conversation in Stockholm. This is, in fact, the, the dinner in 1930 for the opening of the Stockholm exhibition with all of the architects, all of the famous architects, Swedish architects who were there. Leverance is in this picture. And this is Leverance on holiday with Gunnar Asplund and his wife and various other well-known architects. And this threshold to a new, more modern expression coincided with Leverance, coincided with Leverance's fame and success. He was quite successful in the 20s, a well-known architect, well-known young architect. And he was sociable, and he went to dinners, and he gave lectures, and he wrote comment articles, and he wrote articles for books. And this picture that we have of him as a silent, mysterious, char priest-like character, this was not what he was like in the 1920s and 30s. And of course, in the Stockholm exhibition of 1930, he was a key player, designing not only buildings and, and uh, furniture and many other things, but of, but of course, the kind of brand. He was like the branding consultant for the exhibition. The amazing um, poster, of course, which we have upstairs. And he did chairs, which look more like the most wonderful fashion illustrations you've ever seen. He did wallpaper. He did a grand piano, which unfortunately the National Museum got to keep. It's the only thing we don't really have in our exhibition that we wanted to have. But it's on display at the National Museum, so you can see it there. He did, of course, the iconic mast, the um, advertising mast that sat in the middle of the 1930 exhibition fairground. And he, he was responsible for the typography, not for the engineering of the mast and not for the building at the bottom, that was going to Asplund, but for the typography. And there it was in all its glory. Um, what a statement this was of what the modern city should look like. It should look like commerce. It should look like, you know, the alluring, beautiful, shallow pleasures of the commercial city. And the master work of perhaps 
the whole of this period, maybe the whole exhibition, and we love this drawing so much, is this unbuilt proposal for a floating dance floor, which would have been across the water from the fairground. And you can see his mast there in the background with the logo on the top and the fairground just in the, on the horizon. This is a drawing of modern citizens. They, this is 1930. Leverance had grown up. He was born in the late 19th century. His parents were 19th century people. But here he is imagining a completely new kind of citizen, going out into the water to listen to music and have pleasure and dance with one another and fall in love and have a drink. And think about the churches and what they're made of and think about what this is an architecture and what this architecture is made of. This is an architecture made of nothing. It's made of wood and some hanging flags and some lights. It's not really clear how the lights are even supported. <laughs> Balloons, maybe. It's made of boats, and it's made of laughter, and it's made of music, and it's made of atmosphere, and it's made of a course of the wonderful uh, Baltic Sea and the midsummer night that where the sky is the same color as the water. And it's made of all of that. It's made of pleasure. It's an architecture of life. It's an architecture of lightness. And I think it's an amazing achievement that an architect can do both this and St. Mark's in one career. It feels, they feel like opposites, but sort of part of the same tendency. He did lots of other things in 1930, experimental housing types, of course. But this stuff keeps coming back, this kind of image making. Look at this woman getting ready to go out, and she's looking in the mirror and saying to her husband, does it look better like this, my hair? And he's looking at her thinking, oh, can we go? And then later, he's here smoking a cigarette, still waiting maybe, and later still, they're back from their party and they're talking to one another, the same couple placed in different places in the image. It's so filmic, so extremely much about, about imagining broken timelines, about collaging. It's using contemporary artistic practice to express a social idea. His shops, too, have the same, um, the same kind of thing in them. Very direct, in a way. This is one of his own travel photographs, his own photographs from one of his travels to Paris. Maybe that same 1920 trip when he was reading that newspaper. And he takes the same photo every time. A little bit at an angle, a commercial shop front with a glass window, very strong typography, and somebody looking inside. And you see it again and again and again, the same, same photo. And he comes back to Stockholm and draws exactly the same thing. This is a proposal for a shop, a competition for a shop, which he lost actually in, in, um, on Kungsgarten, I think it was. One of my questions as a joke is always, how many women looked like this in Stockholm in 1925? Uh, and maybe not so many, probably more in Paris. But the bigger point, though, and, uh, about Leverance's significance in imagining modern, the modern city, I think, is his modern city was the Walter <coughs> Benjaminian modern city of, the mo of, the, of shopping and of, of the flaneur, of wandering through the streets, of seeing neon, of buying something, of drinking, of music, of pleasure. Later in Swedish 19th, 20th century history, of course, modern architecture becomes very much not that. It becomes about solving societal problems. It becomes about you know, amazing achievements you, you, your culture produced, of course. In, it becomes about equality. It becomes about public space. It becomes about generalizations. But Leverance's modern city was not that. And it's not just an age thing. I think he really believed in the potential for commerce and shopping, <laughs> actually, to contribute something to the modern city. And the reason he's such a provocative artist for us today and the reason he's maybe not in some of those architectural histories and not easy to place is because he loves things that are not good. They're not morally good. They're complicated. Is shopping a moral good? No, no. Shopping's a bit embarrassing. It's a bit kind of commercial. Architects should leave that behind. We should be involved in higher goals. Leverance knew what human beings are really like. Sometimes we're really profound. Sometimes we're really shallow. We're not really very often in between. And so he made architecture for real human beings. These amazing drawings, so appealing, right? I mean, these are not Leverance himself, of course, drawing them, these two wonderful Danish architects he had in his office in this period who could make these great illustrations. But the depth of the shop becomes part of the, pub the visual experience of walking along the street. And these women are specific women. They wear specific jewelry, specific clothes. Um, I'm going to have to skip this. <laughs> Let's move forwards.
1943, though, perhaps the journey began for Leverance towards the, this uh, mythological image we have of him today. When, they, when he moved with his wife to Eskistina, to this building, they bought this factory. Um, it doesn't stand today, sadly. It's been demolished. Um, and this was the place where he, his company, his uh, manufacturing company, Edesta, had its manufacturing. So Leverance and his wife lived on the top floor in this apartment. You see some of the objects from our exhibition in this photograph. Again, you see the, the maquette from Malmö is still is with him. It must have been very new then, actually, 1943. And, they, and he, had a, he had a workshop, uh, he had a drawing studio on the first floor with a balcony that overlooked a production facility on the ground floor. So he was an industrial designer and producer and subcontractor for other architects' work in this period. And this 1943 move to Eskostina, perhaps because we overrate architecture a little bit sometimes, it's like this was a withdrawal from architecture. He took a step back from architecture. He was so disappointed about being sacked from the Woodland Cemetery that he moved away because he was so hurt. Maybe, maybe. But he really was serious about Edesta. He was a multidisciplinary designer ahead of his time, and he wanted to make a great industrial design and manufacturing business, which he did for a while. These were some of the prototypes you can again see upstairs of his patented, many patented window systems, and of course door handles and, and other kinds of metal objects, a lot of typography and signage. And this is an interesting little like nerd fact I thought I'd put in for this audience. Um, this is the back, does anyone recognize this? It'd be amazing if you did. Really famous building, one of the most famous modern buildings in central Stockholm. But you don't usually see it from this direction. Anybody? Nobody. It's the back facade of Sven Markelius' Volkertshus, or Dansen's Hus, as it is today. So, like a major civic building in the middle of Stockholm. But this is the, uh, what's it called, the Valin Garten facade. And this facade was designed with Markelius and Leverance, manufactured by Edesta, and delivered to site and installed. So, he was like a facade subcontractor for Sven Markelius. So interesting that uh, this kind of guy that's such a like, hero of modern architecture, in fact, was quite happy to be a subcontractor to sort out how do you make a metal framed window system with opening windows that's also double glazed. You know, he, it was, that was as much of a design task for Leverance as anything else. Sadly, this, this um, facade is very badly changed um, and changed in something horrifically ugly, but um, the originally it was really nice. <laughs> Um, and that Edesta engagement continued to the 1950s. These, um, anyone remember these? I'm, looking, I'm trying not to look at the older members of the audience. I'm sorry, but um, these were. But they were on the they were on the Tunnelbana in Stockholm till the 1990s. We think we don't know exactly when the last one went away. This is from Barga Mossen from the collection of Sporvex Museet. Um, and it was designed by Peter Selsing together with Sigurd Leverance. Peter Selsing was the chief architect of the Tunnelbana in that time in the 1950s. And they were manufactured in Eskostina and delivered to Stockholm. This is a major civic commission, a major civic industrial design commission. He was serious about Edesta, but it wasn't just Edesta. Um, of course, there was the Malmö Opera House in this period. It completed in 1945, um, Malmö City Theatre, as it was when it opened, and um, was the start of his international fame. But again, for time's sake, we're going to have to go past this. Complicated story you can read about in the, in the book. The public, it's, it's interesting and relevant for today in that he won the competition twice. The public hated his proposal, so kind of forced the politicians to kind of cancel it or, and then forced him to collaborate with two other architects, which in the end turned out reasonably well, but it's exactly a story that could happen today. So none of this, all this architectural raw it stuff, it's not new in Sweden. You've been doing this a long time. It happened, happened in 1940 as well. The last room of our exhibition, the last chapter of Leverance's life and work is, of course, the two great churches, which in, my, in, in a rather all-Svensk way, we call the two late masterpieces in the, church, in, in the room. I'm glad we do that. I think they are masterpieces. And it's not because I want him to be a master. It's because we have to recognize that these are two of the most extraordinary experiences it's possible to have in modern architecture uh, in Sweden. This is St. Mark's in Johan Delin's amazing photographs. But it is very difficult to photograph St. Mark's and St. Peter's. Those of you who have been there, try and take a photo of it and show it to somebody else and say, what's this? They will not know. It's very, very challenging. But Johan's done an amazing job. The extraordinary entrance, this courtyard, and the amazing church room. I should uh, just mention 
that we're about to open an artwork on Friday with the fantastic um, American video artist, film artist, Amy Siegel. Um, she's made two uh, extraordinary films of these two interiors, which will be playing up in Boxen during the summer months. And in this period, the drawing material looks like this. You can hardly see it on the screen, but actually you can hardly see it in reality either. Faint, beautifully rendered, large-scale elevation drawings of bricks. Bricks and bricks and bricks and bricks. Sometimes every brick drawn, sometimes not very many bricks drawn. Sometimes a kind of suggestion of a detail, sometimes an extremely precise engineering solution. There are amazing pieces of brick engineering in St. Mark's, um, most of it invisible. Gone are the beautifully dressed ladies <laughs> and, the, and the fashionable young men and the kind of social complexity of the kind of Benjaminian psychological world of the 1920s. Now we're in a more austere kind of drawing. But he's in his 70s by now. He doesn't have an office anymore. He's mainly lo architects are loaned out to him to do many of these drawings from other people's offices, notably Johan Selsing's office. And interestingly, there are some parts of the buildings that are not even drawn at all. The floors, for instance, of St. Mark's. This is the only drawing we have of of any floors in St. Mark's, and this is in fact the fountain in the courtyard of St. Mark's with this wonderful um, Robert Nielsen uh, uh, bronze that funnels the water into it. I guess this was drawn because it had to be, because it had to hold water, but the rest of, none of the rest of the floors were ever drawn. They were done in collaboration with the workmen and with Robert Nielsen, whose access to the Hergenes pottery gave them access to this amazing source of waste material and rejected material from Hergenes. And they made this amazing collage of the floors. It's like a fifth facade of the building, um, which is not drawn, so not present in the material. So what do we do with this kind of drawing material? Well, we chose to try to lift the significance of art and of his collaborations with, with other disciplines. We discovered um, in the ownership of Robert Nielsen's grandson, the original paintings, designs for the gobelin, the tapestries that hang behind the behind the altar at St. Mark's. They're wonderful, so colorful, so beautiful. Um, never been displayed before. And here's Barbara Nielsen, Robert Nielsen's wife. Barbara Nielsen was a textile artist and weaver, and she wove those gobelang, and here, this is her at St. Mark's. You can just see the pulpit of St. Mark's behind her, working on site. She looks fantastic. I would l so love to have <laughs> been there when she was doing that. That's such an evocative picture of a of a process you can just imagine was wonderful. And Robert Nielsen's artwork, which we have the maquette for upstairs, which stands on the outside door of St. Mark's Church. This amazingly weird piece of symbolism for a Christian church, mostly concerned with Viking history and, and um, pagan parts of Swedish history. And what I think is one of the greatest artworks I've ever seen in, an art, in a church anywhere, which is the Dorp font, the baptismal font at St. Mark's designed with, with Robert Nielsen at the very least. We don't know exactly where the authorship ends between Leverance and Nielsen of this piece and Robert Nielsen's fantastic chandelier above. And this is actually a picture from the front cover of a Fasamlings blad of a parish newsletter. And you can see these little boys understanding the symbolism, I think. Don't you, do you know what I mean? It's like earth and it's fire. And you're standing in the threshold, of course, which is lit by the natural light from, from the side windows. And these little boys understand it. Absolutely. Absolutely, you should lean on that object. That's what it's there for. All of these artworks, for me, are underrated, especially by international uh, visitors to Leverance's buildings. Those who come to see St. Mark's from overseas see it once. And they come to see Leverance, and they find Leverance. I mean, there's enough Leverance in these buildings. But those of us who have been there, perhaps people in the room have been there many times, and I certainly have been. You realize that whenever there was a really important moment in these buildings, Leverance gave that responsibility away to someone else, or at the very least had that moment, thought about that moment in conversation with another artist, and mainly in this case Robert Nielsen, but in St. Peter's other artists too. So the baptismal font, which is such an important part of the competition entry, he doesn't design that. Robert Nielsen designs that. The information-bearing gobelang tapestries, they're not designed by Leverance. They're designed by people who know about pictorial representation, which Leverance does not know about. And then this object, this is the Tree of Life cross, which hangs above the, the second altar, you know, the side altar 
at St. Mark's. There are two altars. And this strange cross, which we know Leverance designed, which is some, I sort of think of it as somewhere between a cross and a crucifix, because it's a cross, of course. But then you see these five red stones, which symbolize the wounds of Christ. So making it something like a crucifix, even though there's no person on it. And these red stones are very similar to works by Robert Nielsen. Robert Nielsen was also a ceramicist and a glass artist, and so worked with this kind of material. It's not hard to imagine that Nielsen contributed the stones. But if you look very closely, and we, we hang it this way around in the exhibition, you can see three names on the back of this. Oh, no, it's gone. Come back. There. Three names on the back of this. There's Sigurd Leverance. These are hollow sections, um, and they're kind of, the names are in little punctures in the steel. And here is Nielsen, spelt wrong, but it's probably M Robert Nielsen, maybe Robert and Barbara Nielsen. And all the way down here, we have another name, Molinsky. And we had no idea who this Molinsky was. There's nobody, Joanna and for all of his amazing scholarship did not know who Molinsky was. So I did um, the really <coughs> professional thing that a curator should do and put it on Instagram and said, uh, does anyone know who this Malinsky is? And thanks to our colleagues at the City Museum, they said, yeah, we do. They had just finished um, digitizing the records of people arrested in the 1900s and 1910s in Stockholm. And this Malinsky is not a very common name. Malinsky was arrested for stealing something from a shop when he was 16 or something like that. So they were like, yeah, we know who he was, he was once a criminal. But then later, he became a metal worker um, and had a whole long career as a metal worker he was about the same age as Leverance, just a couple of years younger. So you can imagine these two quite elderly men um, working together on this object. And I like to believe, partly because the Robert Nielsen's name is spelt wrong, that it was Malinsky who took this decision <laughs> to put these three names on the back. We can't know, of course. But that the names of architect, artist, and handwork and craftsperson are on the back of such an important object in this interior. It tells you something profound that I think a lot of international visitors to these buildings miss, but as Swedes we should celebrate because these buildings come from a culture of extraordinary artistic collaboration. Um, it would be hard to do this today. You, he wouldn't be able to procure Uphandla, Robert Nielsen, probably, um, but in any case, we can, we can still appreciate it. We are over time, so I think I'm going to start to draw it to an end and that's normally, with that object, is normally where I would end my, um, my observations about Sigurd Leverance. There's so much more we could tell you. We had in mind, and I'm still hoping to, Johanna has um, left the museum, but I'm still hoping to invite him back to do the kind of eight-hour lecture version. For, the, for you who really want it all, there might be a few of you, um, we'll, we'll invite Johan back and maybe do that in the last couple of weeks um, of the exhibition. The exhibition's on until the end of August. I hope you'll see it, or maybe even see it today. We'll see it many times while we have it. Um, thanks for listening. I hope that's been interesting. Sorry to br bring it to a rather hasty conclusion, but that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. I would love that eight-hour lecture. Yeah, Maybe a 24-hour lecture. Yeah, I, you could, I think you, I'd spend you know, an, an hour with <laughs> each of these <laughs> images and so many places of lasting meaning that you have presented for us today. The spatial poetry of Sigurd Leverance. Thank you so much for today. My pleasure. Thank you. And for everybody in the room, and now I'm going to speak to Svenska. All who are interested in to follow up on a short introduction to the exhibition.